So chapter one. My name's Cathy H. I'm 31 years old. I've been a carer now for over 11 years. That sounds long enough, I know. But actually, they want me to go on for another eight months until the end of this year. So we've got interesting. We move immediately into this narrative voice. She introduces herself. So we've got a first person narrator who uses very cliched language. So write that on your text. We've also got lots of words that are taken for granted, which raises questions. It seems very mundane. And what's interesting is there's a lack of sophistication from the start, which is very different to the creature. That'll make it almost exactly 12 years. Now, I know my being a carer so long isn't necessarily because they think I'm fantastic at what I do. So her style is quite convoluted. It's indirect, overcomplicated her phrases, and not because she's sophisticated. I wouldn't necessarily talk about her as teenagerish, but I would say it's kind of this cliche, banal, and it's something that we talked about in session one. Her voice, her narrative voice, and of course the key comparison with the creature. There are some really good carers who've been told to stop after just two or three years. And I can think of one carer, at least, who went on for all of 14 years, despite being a complete waste of space. Now I've put square boxes around all the cliches, or what we might call idioms, idioms, waste of space, by and large, hang around, snap out of it get half the credit. Now these make her seem very ordinary. They make her seem very ordinary. We feel comfortable with her voice. We feel she's similar to us. So from the beginning, there's a sense of familiarity, a sense of familiarity with what she's telling us. We know all these phrases, waste of space by and large, hang around, snap out of it. And something again from session one that I would want you to think about is that it's also uncanny. Familiar and yet not. Write down uncanny. Unheimlich. As Jentsch and Freud suggested. So I'm not trying to boast. But then I do know for a fact they've been pleased with my work and by and large I have too. My donors have always tended to do much better than expected. Their recovery times have been impressive and hardly any of them have been classified as agitated, even before a fourth donation. These I've highlighted in green because they are euphemisms. Euphemisms. The language of euphemism. Indirect. Half references. Indirect phrases that we don't fully understand as of yet. Euphemism. And here, carer. Donors. Agitated. Fourth donation, calm. Again, they raise questions. And as I discussed in one of the context films, these are key. These, euphemis these euphemisms are key, which I look at in those. OK, maybe I am boasting now, but it means a lot to me being able to do my work well, especially that bit about my donors staying calm. I've developed a kind of instinct about donors. I know when to hang around and comfort them and when to leave them to themselves, when to listen to everything they have to say and when to shrug and then tell them to snap out of it. Now, on second reading, on first reading, we don't fully understand what's going on. A carer, we understand that concept. We can see she's looking after people. We don't quite know what she's talking about. And then in the second reading, we think she tells the donors to snap out of it when their organs are being harvested and they're about to die. And for me, this is a contextual point, AO3, about slavery. She's encouraging the enslavement of others. And I'll be very cautious with this. As I said in the previous film, you have to be very cautious about using a tone when we talk about this. Perhaps there's a sense that we are all enslaved. We are all enslaved. And then we enslave others into this machinery of living. We all submit to society. We all submit to passively, blindly living up to what society tells us to do. Be consumers, work earn money, do what you're supposed to do, follow society's pressure, 
earn money, pay your way, become part of the state. And this is what Kathy is doing. You've also got a reference, as I talked about in session one, to Terence Ianstadt. I'll write it on the side. So there and Zian Stad. Can you see that? So Terran Zian Stad, ghetto concentration camp from context. That actually that these systems become so organized that the leaders encourage us to submit and then we continue the enslavement of the next generation. If we compare that with Frankenstein, when the creature sees William and the creature thinks that William will be pure and won't despise him. And of course, even a child judges the creature. So we've got lots of questions that are raised. We've got this sense of she's actually continuing the way that the system makes these people passive as they have their organs taken away. She tells them to snap out of it, accept their fate, be passive. Passively accept their fate. Anyway, I'm not making any big claims for myself. I know carers working now who are just as good and don't get half the credit. If you're one of them, I can understand what, how you might get resentful. Now, she addresses us as if we are these things called carers if you're one of them. She addresses her audience as if we completely understand what she's talking about. I can understand how you might get resentful about my bedsit, my car, above all the way I get to pick and choose who I look after. Now, I'm intrigued. Are these privileges? A bedsit, one room, bed sitting room. And she sees these and repeats these images again as great privileges. These seem relatively simple. And this is what she thinks we're going to be resentful over, that she has a bed sit, a car, above all the way I get to pick and choose who I look after. We would be resentful. We would be resentful that she gets to pick and choose who she looks after. It implies an understanding that we simply don't have at this stage. And I'm a Hailshan student. We don't know where this is or what this is. And I'm a Hailsham student, which is enough by itself sometimes to get people's backs up. Kathy H, they say, she gets to, and another idiom, pick and choose. We are in the dark as readers. Something I'd like to draw attention to is the danger of complicity, complying, going along. But also the power of positivity. And this is a really interesting comment in the book. The danger of going along with something, but also the power of positivity, art, human interaction, love, hope. Keshiro Ishiguro says, and this is in session one as well. This is a rather cheerful tale. Don't worry about writing this down because it was in session one. The book really stresses the positive side of human nature. Humans are capable of caring deeply for one another. Now, what's interesting is that's what Ishiguru said about the novel, but we as readers can have a different reading of this. The power of positivity was what Ishiguru said this was about. But is it, and we, it, it forces us, this novel forces us to question, is it better to not know? Is it better to not know that we are part of a state machine? the danger of going along with something, but also the power of positivity. If we're hopeful, if we're positive, we carry on. Kathy, while she has hope, is able to carry on. It's when she's hopeless, she accepts death. 
until that point, until she believes that when they believe in deferrals, they're still hopeful. Let's just have a little look at chapter 22, which, as you know, is a key chapter. Let's just flick quickly to chapter 22. I think it's really important we're able to move between the books and inside the books really fluently. Chapter 22 is the key chapter, one of the key chapters in the novel. You must be super secure on it. But what's interesting about this is that until this point, they have hope. And I'm going to go through until near the end. Let's go to page 263. Hope gives them a belief in the future. And it's the same with the creature. While the creature thinks that he can have a mate. Chapter 16. While the creature thinks he can have a mate, he's hopeful. He still holds on to good. He still holds on to goodness. The creature is exactly the same. In chapter 16, this being you must create. He wants a mate. He wants a creature as hideous as himself that he can then leave the environs of humanity and go away together. He has hope. And even though he has killed William at this stage, at the, in chapter 16, he admits to his killing of William. He thinks there's still hope. If he can find happiness, oneness, sex, love community with another being. So let's just quickly move across to chapter 16 of Frankenstein, whichever copy you have. I'll show it in both. Now I've actually written compare page 23 of Never. If you want to write that on your copy, I'm not going to look at that now. But it is definitely a reference to Tommy. Tommy and the creature make very interesting comparisons. Don't forget that. If you need to write that on your page. Tommy in the picture. So we talked about this in session one. And of course, by the end, he says, this companion must be the spe same species and have the same defects as being you must cr create. And what he has, he's killed William. He looks at Justine and sees her beauty, her humanity, but he realises she's excluded from him. And he wants natural connection. He wants... At the beginning of chapter 17, you must create a female for me with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This alone you can do, and I demand it of you as a right which you must not refuse to concede. Frankenstein refuses. Frankenstein refuses. Shall I create another like yourself whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Be gone, I have answered you. You may torture me, but I will never consent. You're in the wrong, replied the fiend. And look how beautifully he speaks. He's so persuasive. He's measured in his speech in comparison with Frankenstein. He's clearly a noble character the creature and instead of threatening i am content to reason with you frankenstein threatens him and he decides he's going to reason with frankenstein i am malicious because i am miserable this clearly references john locke he's a tabula rasa a blank slate which of course mary Shelley's father believed in Tabula rasa, a blank slate. Tabula, tablet, rasa, blank. Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? You, my creator, would tear me to pieces and triumph. Remember that and tell me why I should pity, a ma why I should pity man more than he pities me. You would not call it murder if you could precipitate me into those, one of those ice rifts and destroy my frame. The work of your own hands. Shall I respect man when he condemns me? He says, 
he would bestow every benefit on him. If he was treated with kindness, he would give humans benefit. He would be grateful at being accepted. But that cannot be. The human senses are insurmountable barriers. Humans judge me. This is key to never let me go. Humans judge him. Yet mine shall not be the submission of abject slavery. He will not accept his position as slave. I will revenge my injuries. If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Like Tommy, he rages against his position. He wants love, and if he cannot have this, if he cannot find oneness with someone, if he cannot find natural connection and sex, love, equality with a woman, with a female creature, he will decide to rage against his position. And, of course, Frankenstein is moved. But, actually, let's just look at the paragraph which starts, I intended to reason. I demand a creature of another sex as hideous as myself, the gratification is small. Our lives will not be happy, so they're gonna be monsters cut off from the world, excuse me. Our lives will not be happy, but they will be harmless and free from the misery I now feel. Oh, my creator, make me happy. Let me feel gratitude towards you for one benefit. Let me see I excite the sympathy of some existing things. Be sympathetic. And then he says, they'll go to South America. He doesn't eat animals. He's a vegetarian. I do not throw the lamb and the kid to glut my appetite. Acorns and berries. He's clearly a tabula rasa. Lives off the land. We will be content with the same fare, with the same food. We should make our bed of dried leaves. The sun will shine on us and ripen our food. This is a new Adam. Frankenstein asks, of course, are you going to leave society? Leave the habitations of man. How will you, how long will you last in exile? You will come back. You won't you won't be able to stop yourself. You'll want to come back to human society. The creature says he won't. But of course, what's interesting is he says they will go away to the savage and wild places. Now, all of this compares with the with the uh, a couple of key moments. Let's have a little look for a moment. Now let's compare to page 264 of Measure. So in your Frankenstein copy, I would write, not only compare with 260, but 264, the revulsion. Okay, so always make sure that you write what book, what the cross references are. And best, good idea to do CF, which means cross reference. Let's just now move to 264. So Frankenstein is utterly revolted by his creature, by his child. And of course, then Miss Emily says of Marie Claude, is she afraid of you? We're all afraid of you. I myself had to fight back my dread of you almost every day I was at Hailsham. There were times I'd look down at you from my study window and I'd feel such revulsion. They're hated. So chapter se ch chapter 17. And then what's interesting is now at this moment where there's no more hope. Look at this. Tommy and I stayed in the hall for a while longer. Not sure what to do. The hope is gone. They cannot defer. Deferrals weren't possible. They were a mirage. False hope. And now they don't know what to do. They are passive. Well, I'm going to. They're passive. Very different to the creature. Whereas the creature rages and gives himself over to killing. You're destroyed either way. You're destroyed either way. 
you're destroyed whether you're passive or you're destroyed whether you rage against the system. It's really interesting that Ishiguro says these novels of hope. I would argue they can be hopeful and also hopeless. So then they, there's conversation. And there's an important point at this point where she speaks as poor creatures, poor creatures, which I think for me are key quotations. And I've got a link to page 71 of this novel. So just write that on your page 267. You can just write a note to yourself to cross-reference with page 71. Now, what's important is then, as I discussed in session one, Tommy rages, 268, 269, Tommy rages against this system that he's forced into. He rages again against the system he's in. And then they revert to their purpose. In many ways, it was a relief. Endlessly, pointlessly. So this is page 273. So what's fascinating is we start with a sense of Pride in Hailsham, pride, pick and choose. The sense that she has a choice, she has options, she has a purpose, she's got something to do. And we finish with a real sense of this, even this, it's not a choice. Even this was not a choice. Let's go on. Kathy H, they say, she gets to pick and choose. She always chooses her own kind, people from Hailsham or one of the other privileged estates. That foreshadows the end. Write that on your page. So privileged estates, Hailsham, Glen Morgan, I think it was. Let me just check. Whereas Kingsfield is not like Hailsham. 274, linked 274 Kingsfield is not like Hailsham, where Tommy is. Um, and you've also got, for example, where's the, is it Glen Morgan? Let me check. Yes, Glen Morgan. On page 260. Glen Morgan, Hailsham, sought to try and give them homes. But of course, you'd not sleep for days if you saw what still goes on in some of those places, the clone factories. Glen Morgan and Hailsham treat them like humans. The other ones are literally just factories for clones. So she knows this. She assumes we know this. No wonder she has such a great record. I've heard it said enough. So I'm sure you've heard it plenty more and maybe there's something to it. But I'm not the first to be allowed to pick and choose. No doubt I'll be the last. And anyway, I've done my share of looking after donors brought up in every kind of place. By the time I finish, remember, I'll have done 12 years of this. And it's only for the last six they'll let me choose. We wonder why on earth she's going on about this for so long. And why shouldn't they? Carers aren't machines. Of course, this is deeply ironic. Because they are treated as machines. The white coats, which is what she calls doctors, they do treat them like machines. You try and do your best for every donor, but in the end, it wears you down. You don't have unlimited patience and energy. So when you get a chance to choose, of course, you choose your own kind. So she, what's interesting is she, as a clone, is then creating a hierarchy for the clones. Hierarchy, even in the out group. That's an important theme that I'm going to discuss later. These out groups still have hierarchies. Once you get a little power, you bully those beneath you. Now, she's not at this point bullying. This is much more true, uh, much more the case when we talk about Tommy in a few pages time. You don't. So uh, that's natural. There's, so that is interesting. That's humanity, isn't it? That we are taught to use our power. Frankenstein uses his power over the creature. The creature uses his power over Frankenstein. 
There's no way I could have gone on for as long as I have if I'd stopped feeling for my donors every step of the way. And anyway, if I'd never started choosing, how would I ever have got close again to Ruth and Tommy? And we're immediately wondering, who are Ruth and Tommy? But these days, of course, there's no of course about it. So again, her narrative style, implying we should know all these things. There are fewer and fewer donors left who I remember. And so in practice, I haven't been choosing that much. As I say, the work gets a lot harder when you don't have that deeper link with the donor. And though I miss being a carer, I'll miss being a carer. It feels just about right to be finishing at, at last. Come the end of the year. Finishing at last? That's not the way we necessarily would refer to death. And we get a sense that she's pretending. Can she pretend she has another option? No. But does she avoid discussing it openly? Yes. That's very different to the creature. He openly acknowledges his position. Difference. Very different to the creature. Who will not passively accept his situation. It feels about just about right to be finishing at last, come to the end of the year. For what? Finishing? Finishing caring? Of course, this means she's going to give her organs away. And the fourth donation will likely kill her. Ruth, incidentally, was only on the was only the third or fourth donor I got to choose. She already had a carer assigned to her at the time, and I remember it taking a bit of nerve on my part. But in the end, I managed it. And the instant I saw her again at that recovery centre in Dover, highlight that recovery centre in Dover. And I'm going to say it. We discussed it in session one. We have the beginning of a sense of terror. We have these hints and we have this sense of the uncanny, familiar and yet not. A recovery centre in Dover, all our differences, well they didn't exactly vanish, seemed not nearly as important as the other things, like the fact that we'd grown up together at Hailsham, the fact that we knew and remembered things no one else did. It's ever since then I suppose I started seeking out for my donors, people from the past, and whenever I could, people from Hailsham. There have been times over the years when I've tried to leave Hailsham behind, when I've told myself I shouldn't look back so much. But then there came a point where I just stopped resisting. It had to do with this particular donor I had once in my third year as a carer. It was his reaction when I mentioned I was from Hailsham. He'd just come through his third donation. Euphemism. We as readers are asking questions. We don't understand what's going on. What's interesting is she looks back because there's nothing to look forward to. The creature keeps looking forward. He watches the Delacy's and learns about family life and he learns to hope that he can have that same natural family. But we, we realise we don't quite understand this world. Third donation hadn't gone so well. Now, it doesn't sound too bad. Donation, giving away something, hadn't gone well. Euphemism. Ishiguro never talks about what is given away. What is it first? One kidney and then something else that we don't need. And then the fourth donation is your heart or... What is the third donation? Euphemism. It hadn't gone well. And he must have known he wasn't going to make it. Now we suddenly realise that these donations mean death. He could hardly breathe. And perhaps we're still at terror but we might even in these early stages move to horror unless we pass this by. It's very easy to move this by, pass this by and not 
feel physical revulsion at what we start to wonder is happening. He could hardly breathe, but he looked towards me and said, Hailsham, I bet that was a beautiful place. Then the next morning, when I was making up conversation to keep his mind off it all, and I'd asked where he'd grown up, he mentioned some place in Dorset, and his faith beneath the blotches began to, went into a completely new kind of grimace. Where did you grow up? And he grimaces. And I realised then how desperately he didn't want to be reminded. Was it page 264? No. 260. Page 5. Page 260. Page 5. He didn't want to remember. A clone factory. He didn't want to remember his childhood. Hailsham is superficially idyllic. It, it, it is idyllic. It's absolutely idyllic. By the way, hail sham, sham, a pretense. Hail, giving something reverence to a sham. Reverence to something false. And I realised then how desperate he didn't want to be reminded. Instead, he wanted to hear about Hailsham. So over the next five or six days, I told him, Whatever he wanted to know, and he'd lie there all hooked up, a gentle smile breaking through. He'd ask me about the big things, the little things, about guardians. How we had each had our little collection chest, and I'm thinking, not family belongings. Not family belongings under your bed, collection chests. The football, the rounders, the little path that took you all around the outside of the main house, around its nooks and crannies, the duck pond, the food, the view from the art room over the fields on foggy mornings. This seems idyllic. It seems utterly idyllic. Perfect. Sometimes he'd make me say things over and over, things I told him only the day before. He'd asked about whether I'd never taught about, like I'd never told him. Did you have a sports pavilion? Which guardian was your special favourite? Boarding school. At first I thought this was just the drugs, but then I realised his mind was clear enough. What he wanted was not just to hear about Hailsham, but to... Remember Hailsham just like it had been his own childhood. He was getting close to completing. Circle that. Euphemism. For death. When he was getting close to dying. He wants to make false memories. He wants to make false memories. And that's key to the whole novel. Because that's exactly what Kathy does. She recreates her memories to make it seem there was worth, there was importance. Memories, as we spoke about in the first session. The key theme of memories, telling your tale, making sense. He knew he was close to completion. So that's what he was doing, getting me to describe things to him so they'd really sink in, so that maybe during those sleepless nights with the drugs and the pain and the exhaustion. The line would blur between what my memories were and what were his. I've said this is very different to Frankenstein because this is so mundane. It seems so boring. Describing the minutiae detail of conversations with someone who's dying. Shelley's novel is such a contrast. It's so gothic from the start. So shocking. So far removed from a 19th century reader, gothic, foreign travel, events, political, shocking, different, alien. This is so similar and yet not. And of course I've written here, this is subtly sinister, subtly sinister. That was when I first understood, really understood, just how lucky we'd been. Tommy, Ruth, me, all the rest of us. The creature builds memories by looking in at the DeLacy's cottage. He calls them my friends. Builds from and memories with my friends, my cottagers. 
The novels are both about what we choose to believe. And also what's interesting is all the way through this novel, we have lots and lots of references to how beautiful Hailsham was. For example, um, when she talks about the pond. In chapter three. If you compare the beginning of chapter three with 274, when she talks about Kingsfield. And this bit about the pond and the beautiful idyllic location. Places seem more important than people because they are so alone. Places seem more important than people because they are so alone and that's all they have. They have Norfolk, the pond. They don't have relationships. They can't. They can't have relationships. They are destined to die. So it's really interesting to compare with Kingsfield on page 274 where they have to climb through um, thistles and weeds to have any outdoor time. So definitely worth comparing that. Driving around the country now, back to page six. I still see things that remind me of Hailsham. I might pass a corner of a misty field or see part of a large house in the distance. And I come down the side of a valley, even a particular arrangement of poplar trees on a hillside. And I think maybe that's it. I found it. This actually is Hailsham. She can't find her way back to her past. The way back. She is utterly lost. She is quite literally homeless. She can't find her way back to the place that was like her home. Then I see it's impossible and I go on driving. My thoughts, do you notice how that she does that? Drifting elsewhere, in fact, the pavilions, I spot them all over the country. So for example, pavilions on sports fields, 